Thank you so much, Tim and Lori. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, Mary Beth and I are really excited about this presentation today. And what we have prepared is a discussion for about 40 minutes on general landlord tenant law. Um, and we're going to discuss a little bit at the end about the specific coronavirus related protections that are still in place of which there are not many. And then for the rest of the session up till 945 we're going to be specifically discussing the Fair Housing Act and how that um, how that applies in certain different circumstances so I'm going to share my screen now, hopefully. And it will be PowerPoint from the beginning. So um, Mary Beth is, uh, is joining us as a disembodied voice, but she brings years of experience to this, to this work. And she's going to kick us off with the um, discussion of landlord-tenant law. Uh, you say okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, so we're, uh, Lori gave a great introduction and we're gonna, as she said, discuss these um, different issues related to landlord tenant law that gives a background to how the Fair Housing Act relates to all this. So the landlord tenant law in the state of Pennsylvania is governed by both a uh, landlord tenant act and case law. The landlord tenant act was enacted in 1951 and that sets forth the responsibilities of uh, the landlord and the tenant, including the eviction process, um, which applies to both written and verbal leases. So a uh, lease is a contract, and that's what you have with the landlord, but that doesn't mean it needs to be in writing. It can be a verbal contract. This does not apply to rooming houses. Rooming houses are governed by a different law called the Innkeepers Act, which has specific regulations there. So as I said, the lease can be written or verbal. And when I say that landlord tenant law has an act, which is in the statutes, it also is governed by case law because the case law sets forth what we call the warranty issues. And we're gonna get into the warranty of habitability later. The basics of the eviction process, we're going to go more into this, but the most important, well, not the most important things, but the basics to start. A landlord cannot lock a tenant out or make the unit unavailable to force the tenant out. They must take them to court. So you don't pay rent, you allegedly violate a lease agreement somehow. The landlord just can't come knock on your door and say, hey, I want you to leave tomorrow. Okay. They can't turn off the water. If it's winter, they can't turn off the heat. They must file a legal process. And when we say a legal process, we mean the landlords have to take a tenant to court. You have to go to court before a judge before you can be legally evicted in the state of Pennsylvania. From the, you go to court, the judgment, the judge issues a decision we call judgment. Sometimes it's the same day, but not in writing. So from the time you get the judgment, the time the judgment is dated, a tenant will have about 21 days before they have to vacate the property, if they have to vacate. And we're gonna go into this uh, in a few minutes about the difference, differences and the options available to tenants. Then, then there is an appeal period, which always gives the tenant more time to move. And again, we're gonna go into this in a little bit, but it's important to remember they can't lock it out. So if someone comes to you and says that my landlord gave me a piece of paper, they say I have to be out in three days. No, it's not, that's not, it's not that simple. So the tenant, the way the eviction process should start is the tenant receives from the landlord what we call a notice to quit. So this is typically a notice that says, you didn't pay your rent. And if you don't pay your rent in so many days, we're going to evict you. Or you violated the lease because you have a dog and the dog was barking and the neighbors have been complaining for a period of time and you must get rid of the dog in 15 days or we're going to evict you. Or it can simply be your lease ends. You know, we have a le lease with you, the time of the lease has ended and we are going to evict you. 
Typically, the notice to quit should give the tenant an opportunity to fix whatever problem the landlord is alleging. So it's sort of a time to say like, oh, I owe you rent. Let me talk to you about why I didn't pay it. And here it is. Or my dog's barking a lot. I'm taking him to training or I'm going to have a dog sitter during the day or I'm doing something to fix these problems so I don't have to be evicted. This cannot be waived, okay, in a verbal lease. So about two kinds of lease, verbal and written. So it can be waived in a written lease, okay? So a written lease can say tenant doesn't receive this notice to quit, but they can't be waived in a verbal lease because there's no written lease there to be able to waive it. The landlord then, if you don't fix the problem or the landlord doesn't agree to the terms of fixing the problem, and you don't leave within the period of that notice to quit, that timeline, the landlord, this is when the landlord has to go to court. So they have to file a complaint in court, uh, the district court, and the, the district court schedules a hearing. The hearing's typically scheduled, you know, seven to 10 days later. The tenant then receives in the mail a complaint and a notice of the hearing date. So this should set forth the complaint, the specific reasons for the eviction, okay? Sometimes this is posted on the door and, and tenants don't like that. They think it's an invasion of privacy and that's understandable, but it's allowed to be posted on the door. But they should look for that. And you know, lately we've been having a lot of trouble with mail and delays. So I tell clients who call me now, if they received a notice to quit, and it's past that time period, you yeah, can always call the court to check. There's also a docket process. You can go online to check just to make sure they're not missing something there. So once the tenant receives the complaint and notice of hearing, they do have the opportunity to file what we call a cross complaint. And that's basically a defense and that's related to money issues. So the landlord says, I'm evicting you because you didn't pay the rent for the month of, where are we, April, for the month of March. And the tenant didn't pay the rent for the month of March because they needed to use that money to make repairs on the property that the, the landlord didn't make. Then the tenant can file a cross complaint saying that. And what that does is assure that when you get to court, the judge hears both sides of this story. Okay, so the, the tenant has a real opportunity to present their case. Once this is all done, a hearing again is held and judgment is issued. The judge listens to both sides of uh, both parties, hopefully, and issues a judgment. It's important to keep in mind that what- It's important what, to keep in mind that- what, 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 Thanks. Oh, Mary Beth, well, if you can mute yourself. Oh, sorry, sorry, thanks. sorry. Okay. Um, what we what we're talking about right now are the the basic landlord tenant rules that apply in a private housing um, private rental situation. People who live in public housing or have a housing subsidy have additional protections, and we we don't have time to get into that today. But this what we're talking about is sort of the baseline of protections for people that are in. Um, a private housing relationship with a, a landlord. So let me see if I can. Okay. So uh, as Mary Beth discussed, the process to getting into court is generally a notice to quit, which is just a letter from the landlord. It doesn't have to be notarized. It's not a court filing. It's just a letter from the landlord. Usually these matters start with that. And if the notice period ends and the issue hasn't been resolved and the landlord files the case in court, the tenant gets notice of the case. The tenant really needs to show up to the hearing. If you don't show up to the hearing, you're definitely not going to win it. Um, you know, the, the likelihood is that a judgment will be issued on that day against the tenant if they do not show up and the landlord does show up to present the case. So at the hearing, um, if a judgment for possession is granted, there are two types of judgments that I'm going to discuss. It is also possible that the case will either be dismissed or that the tenant will win the case and it will be judgment for the defendant tenant. And if that is what happens, then 
the case goes away unless the landlord appeals it. But if the tenant loses, um, there's two types of judgments generally that are gonna be issued. One is straight possession, possession granted, um, and no opportunity to pay arrears. Um, and there's basically nothing you can do at that point except for appeal the decision in order to avoid the eviction. The other alternative is possession granted if the money judgment is not satisfied. So the judge will find that the tenant owes money to the landlord. And if the tenant does not pay that money to the landlord, by the time the constable comes to the door to um, effectuate the um, eviction, then the eviction will go forward. But if the tenant can pay that money, then the eviction will be forestalled. This is an important issue right now, especially for those of you um, joining us that are, are working on the various rental assistance programs. Um, if someone gets a straight possession judgment, then money's not gonna fix that and it has to be appealed. But if they get a pay and stay, then, um, then it is possible to be able to make up the arrears with the landlord and make the eviction go away. It is important to note that even if the, the, the money is paid during the pay and stay, um, the um, eviction sort of stays open for a certain number of days. The landlord has, um, it might be, it used to be 120 days and then I think there was a change and now it's 180 days that's being looked at right now, but the landlord has that amount of time if they have a judgment to execute it. So they can always get an order for possession sort of at any time in that time period. So you're not quite out of the woods if you if you make that first um, if you make that first payment, you still should get um, what's called the satisfaction of the judgment on the record to show that that this is over. So um, those are the two types of judgments that could happen. Is there a question? Yeah, Sarah. Um, there's a question. If there's a pay and stay, who is responsible for the court filing fees? The court filing fees are generally going to be rolled into the judgment um, as part of the amount of money that the tenant has to pay. So if the tenant loses and gets a judgment against them, then they're responsible for the filing fees. So that's wrapped into the amount that has to be paid in order to stay. Um, and then another question, does pay and stay money have to be cash? Hmm. So, if the does it have to be cash? cash. Um, no, it can be any type of payment that that um, that the landlord can can accept. So it could be a money order. Um, you know, it's up to the landlord. The landlord doesn't want to take a personal check. I mean, the landlord should take a personal check and try to um, you know try try to cash it. But uh, basically, whatever valid form the money takes um, is going to be sufficient as long as you know the check clears. Um, so Jennifer Mull uh, says at NBN, we have been successful at times with straight possession to actually stop the possession. That's great. There are um, there are sort of ways that you can, can attack this. Um, I think it's always safest if it is straight possession to also appeal in order to um, protect the, the tenant's rights. And then a couple more questions. Um, is there a requirement that the landlord record the satisfaction? And then the other question is, does it matter where the money comes from to satisfy the pay and stay order? It does not matter where the, the money comes from. Um, you know, if it's like a, like if a friend is going to pay it or a family member, or if it comes from a rental assistance program, no, it doesn't matter. Money is money. If it's paid, it's paid. Um, and no, there is no requirement that landlord file a satisfaction of judgment. There is a specific form in Pennsylvania um, for use at the magistrate's office, and that form has a signature line for the, the plaintiff to sign that says, yes, this has been satisfied. Um, it's up to them whether they want to do it or not. There's no requirement. Any more and, questions? Um, could they agree to use the security deposit to pay the, uh, the pay and stay order? So the security deposit, the purpose of the security deposit is to cover any damages that the tenant might um, do at the property. And 
if the security deposit is, is usually dealt with as a separate issue after the tenant moves out, and there's a process for that we're going to discuss briefly later, um, but it is sort of um, possible to try to negotiate the use of the security deposit, but there's nothing that requires the landlord to um, bring that back into play because they're basically forfeiting any ability to you know, use the money then to make repairs if repairs are needed. Um, so it can be negotiated, but there's no requirement that it be used for that purpose. Okay. That's all of the questions that are there right now, sir. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, thank so you. I just um, wanna add one thing about the cash payment for the pay and stay, and we'll get into this in a little bit, but if, it, if the constable is coming to your door to evict you and you wanna pay to remain, they will only take cash. They're not gonna take your check and wait to see if it's granted. Uh, the other thing is the satisfaction of the judgment. I did have a case once where the landlord would not agree to market satisfied, even though the tenant had paid in full to avoid the eviction. And we contacted the district court and uh, there was a form we had to complete to make sure that the judgment was marked satisfied, even though the landlord didn't agree to do that to avoid the eviction. So there is an action you can take to get that done if necessary. Thank you, Mary Beth. Um, and I'll also add that, okay, so if the constable is at the door, then they'll only take cash but you have up, the tenant has up until that point. They have cash when the constable comes, they pay it to the constable that that satisfies the pay and stay. So that's when you have a pay and stay, you have up until that very last moment to pay it. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the appeals process. Um, if possession is granted or whatever happens, but whatever the decision is, both parties have 10 days from the date of the judgment to file an appeal. All days count minus holidays. And if the 10th day falls on a holiday or a weekend, then it's gonna be the following you know, open court day that is the deadline for it to be filed. So the landlord can't really do anything during that time. Appeals get filed at the county courthouse um, in, the, in the county where the magistrate court was. And it does cost money to file an appeal. However, if um, our, our clients are generally people of low income that can file what's called an informa pauperis petition, which is a petition to not have to pay filing fees. So those fees can be waived. The other um, cost related with filing an appeal, if a tenant's filing the appeal, is a bond, which is called a, a supersedious payment. And this basically is um, equivalent to the amount of rent that you would normally be paying to the landlord, you have to pay into the court while the appeal is pending. Now, if you have already paid your rent for the month that you're filing the appeal, you can say that and then not have to pay any money at the time of filing. If you have not paid your rent at the, at the, that for that month in which you're appealing, then you must pay at least one third of the amount of rent that is owed um, per, for a month, a monthly payment of rent. Um, and then within 20 days, pay the remainder of the monthly rent to the, to the court. So you stop making payments to the landlord, start making payments to the court to hold an escrow for the landlord. And then every 30 days after the date of having filed the appeal, you have to make that same payment. And the amount of the monthly rent is set in the, the magistrate judge's order. So that is a part of the um, eviction hearing. It'll say right in the order, the monthly rent is you know, $800. And then um, you have to pay one third of that upon filing the appeal, two thirds of it within 20 days, and then $800 every 30 days from the date of filing the appeal. If you miss one supersedious payment by one day, the landlord can come in, revoke the supersedious, ha have it terminated, and, and that's it. Then they can get an order for possession. Um, so you need to stay current with those payments in order to hold off possession being granted to the landlord while the appeal is pending. 
Um, let's see. So that I think is, is appeals and supersedious. That is how that works. And then the process after the, the tenant files the appeal is that the landlord must then file a complaint and then the, the tenant has to answer the complaint. Eventually it's set for a hearing. Um, this will buy the tenant some time. And if the tenant finds a way to resolve the issue or, or move out in that time, then these cases can frequently be settled. This is the only way to make sure that um, the landlord does not get an order for possession to arrange for the constable to come out um, to, the, to the property. So um, we do recommend if possession is granted to, to file the appeal. And um, yeah, so if no appeal is filed within the 10 days that you have to file an appeal, then on the 11th day, the landlord goes back to the magistrate and requests an order for possession. And then that order for possession is served on the tenants. And 10 days after that is when the constable is scheduled to come out. Um, and what the constable will do in order to execute the eviction is change the locks at the property and remove all of the um, you know, individuals from the property. So the constable does not come and arrest anyone unless there's a, a disturbance of the peace or something like that. You don't get arrested because you've been evicted. The constable does not um, come out and throw all of your stuff on the street. Um, that's not what happens to your stuff. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the constable will come and change the locks. It does not matter at that point if you have a child, if you're sick, if you have an infant, if you have a disability, if you're elderly, if you have nowhere to go. None of that stops the eviction from happening if, if the process has gone through to this point. Um, if the first time a tenant hears about this is when they get an order for possession served on them at their house, like if for whatever reason they didn't know about the hearing and suddenly the order for possession is, is issued, then there is a more complicated court process that we would have to go through in order to prevent the eviction. So if anyone finds themselves in that situation and they qualify for the services of North Penn, they should contact us immediately without any delay because there is only a really limited amount of time to do anything to, to stop the eviction at that point. Um, Sarah, there's a question. Um, what court does the appeal take place? So the appeal goes to the um, county. So the, the original um, cases are filed at the magistrate level, and every county has a number of magistrate magisterial districts. So it goes to the MDJ. And then the appeal goes to the county courthouse for the county that the um, that the property is in. Okay, so we already kind of talked about um, if there's a pay and stay. Okay, what that is. Um, you can file an appeal if you got a pay and stay. Um, that that sort of means the pay and stay. Um, doesn't count anymore. If you if you if you file the appeal of the pay and stay instead of paying, then um, then paying you still have to sort of deal with the appeal process. So there might still be good reasons to appeal if you get a pay and stay, um, especially if you get a pay and stay and you know you're not going to be able to make a payment within 21 days. Then the only way to protect yourself usually is to file an appeal. Now, there are some special rules because of the coronavirus that we'll get into. Um, so if you disagree with the judgment amount or you're not going to be able to pay it, you can still file an appeal. Um, so are there any questions about that process? Are there any I'm about to move into warranty of habitability and other uh, repair issues and stuff like that. So there is one question. So if you're appealing the money judgment, um, do you have 30 days to appeal? Yes. Yeah. Um, so it's 10 days to appeal the order for possession, which is that the landlord gets the property back and you have to leave. And if all you're appealing is the money judgment against you and you're going to leave or you already left, then you have 30 days to file that appeal. Good. Good question. 
And Sarah, if I could just add there that it, the landlord also has 10 days to appeal the possession and 30 days to appeal the money judgment. So in either case, if you're appealing possession from the tenant side or the landlord's time side, you need to do so within 10 days. Otherwise you're forced to file a petition to appeal out of time. We use Latin nunc pro tunc. Um, and there you have to um, assert some specific reasons why you're appealing late and why the court should allow you to do so. Um, um, and it's not as simple as just saying, I just didn't get around to it. Um, so, so it's that 10 days. Thanks. And then um, just to keep, keep us on track. Um, time, if Mary Beth wants to head into the warranty issues. Okay, so the warranty of habitability, we talked about this earlier, and this is what was decided by case law. Um, it's implied in every lease in Pennsylvania. So whether it's a verbal lease or a written lease, you're going to have the warranty of habitability implied in that lease, and it's going to apply to the rental property. It means that the landlord has an obligation to provide safe and sanitary conditions for tenants. So doors that lock, working heat, working smoke detectors, running water, free of insect and rodent infestation, those things are applied in the lease. You can't get around that by renting an apartment as is. So I had a tenant call me the other day, they're having problems with the conditions of their apartment, the landlord's not making repairs, and they said, well, my lease says that I rented the apartment as is. And you know, I was like, yeah, well, you can't do that. <laughs> it's not considered a legal lease term. So if the case ended up in court or when we negotiate with the landlord, that is something that we would bring up. Cities and municipalities can impose higher standards that are more specific. So some of, you might find a municipality that says what, what the heat has to be in an apartment. But generally, these are, these are the conditions that we're looking for, that you want to move into an apartment that you can look around and it doesn't need a lot of repairs and it's able to be, um, you're able to live in it without any concerns. Our, my experience is that if you're moving into an apartment that ha needs a lot of repairs and the landlord is saying, don't worry, I'll make them in the future, they're not really going to get done because good landlords have the property up to code enforcement, up to stand that which is city standards and has it ready to move in and they want to make sure their clients are safe and secure, their tenants, excuse me, are safe and secure. This doesn't always happen. So a lot of times we need to make sure that you tenants understand how to get repairs made. And there is a process for requesting repairs. And first of all, a landlord can't make repairs if they don't know there's a problem. So they should contact the landlord first and give them a chance to make repairs. And they should keep track of those calls and requests. The timeline for the repairs being made really depends on the severity of the problem. So if you're calling your top landlord, you know, so you can call first, right? So you call the landlord, you say, hi, my toilet's running. It's making that weird sign. Every time I flush it, it goes around and around and it makes a weird noise, but it is flushing. But I would like this to be repaired, please. That would be called a minor repair. If it's something like the toilet is backing up and not flushing and ca causing sewage and waste to be in your uh, bathroom and through your house, then that's a very severe problem. And in that case, you call the landlord, listen, this is like an emergency. I don't know what's happening here. That one, maybe respond immediately. The other one, give them a couple days to respond. Follow it up in writing. It used to be letters. Right now you have email, you have texts. I think there's other ways through Facebook to do these kind of things. I'm not sure, but something in writing saying, here's what's happening. This is the repair I needed. This is the problem. Please contact me. This is to protect yourself in case the case goes to court, in case the landlord doesn't make those repairs. 
If it's a very serious problem, you're not getting any response from the landlord, you can call code enforcement. Those are um, uh, the people who will come out and assess the problem and contact the landlord and say that the needs to be repaired and usually give a timeline for that. The concern with causing code enforcement, just to be aware of that if the problem affects the livability of the apartment, they may what we call red tag it and tell the clients, tell the tenants that they have to leave. So it's a balance there, whether or not you're gonna call that. It's always good to reach out to the landlord and, and try to get them to make the repairs. If Very the bad. landlord Very. is not making the repair. Very bad. Very. Well, sorry. There's just a question about the door There's lock. question uh, about the door lock and the warranty of habitability. Uh, and the warranty of habitability. The, does, the, does that does, cover does like that external cover, building like, locks, external even building if the locks, internal units, the have, internal their own units locks? have their own locks? Well, I, you know, if there's locks on the door and there's lock, a lock that protects the building, then that lock should be secure. I don't, I mean, Sarah, what, what would your take on that be? I mean, if certainly if, if that, that, I mean, if certainly if you mute, mute yourself, Mary Beth, quick. I mean, if that's, that's, that seems like a, a health and safety violation. That's, 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 that seems like if we've seen a um, couple of stories in the news recently about landlords in Allentown who had front doors that were inoperable and anyone was gaining access to the interior hallways and doing God knows what inside those hallways. So that creates an unsafe environment for everyone in the building. That is, yeah. So even if it's not like specifically related to your unit, if it is a common area that you don't have control of, but there's still a problem that is affecting the habitability of the property, then then yeah, that would that would count. Okay, so the screen I have up now is property left in home, but I just wanted to go through the options if repairs are not made first. So um, there is an option if the landlord doesn't respond to your request for repairs, you can do what we call repair and deduct. So that means giving the landlord notice after he hasn't made repairs, you haven't, I requested these repairs, these repairs were not made landlord, what I'm going to do is get my own person to make the repairs and deduct the cost from next month's rent. When you do that, you need to make sure you get people who are in that profession to make the repairs. So it's not like calling your brother's cousin's son to make the repair. It's getting estimates for the repairs from, rev from people who are uh, in that line of work and then choosing the most reasonable repair and reasonable cost and keeping those receipts. That's very important. Another option is you can send something to the landlord saying you never made the repairs. I can't afford, you know, they're more, they're more costly than even a month's rent because the whole ceiling is falling down. So I am gonna break my lease and move out. Even though I'm in the middle of a lease term, you're making the place uninhabitable. So I'm gonna break that lease and move out. You can always withhold the rent, but we don't really recommend this because it can lead to an eviction and then you're gonna be in court. So if you're gonna choose that option, actually, if you're gonna choose any of the options, you should give our office a call or speak to someone uh, about that. And then you can always sue the landlord for back rent and other expenses if you have to vacate the apartment. Mary Beth, there's a question about the withholding Beth, rent process. Could you about just the maybe go a little bit more process. detail and what someone would need to do? More detail and what someone would need to do. So again, we don't really to recommend rent. withholding the rent for repairs not being made. Um, and the reason for that is to do it correctly, you have to set up an escrow account. And the escrow account requires it to be in both the landlord and tenant's name. So you have to get certain information from the landlord to arrange that account. And again, you would definitely need proof 
that the conditions made the place unlivable. So there are situations where if code enforcement has come into the apartment and they have tagged the apartment and they have said that the tenant has to vacate, in those situations, we would say, yes, of course, you're not gonna pay the next month's rent because you need that money to move because the place is uninhabitable and code enforcement has said that. But people have different, different opinions about what's uninhabitable and that can lead to some concerns when it gets to court. I'm gonna ask Sarah to address it a little more because she actually goes to court and has been in court with these issues. So uh, Sarah, if you could elaborate on that a little bit, that would be great. What, as far as what happens when there's habitability what issues? As far as what hearing? happens when there's habitability issues in the court hearing? Yes. Well, I want to I want to keep us on track for time, um, but it, it I guess I'll say it depends. It, it very much depends. I mean, I think um, in general, what you want to do if you get an ev eviction filed against you because you didn't pay rent because of bad conditions, then what you want to do is file a counterclaim so that the judge can hear both sides of the of the case that, you know, what the landlord's ar argument is against you that you should have paid rent. Well, your argument with the tenant's argument is against the landlord, why you didn't pay rent. And then sometimes the judge will issue a, a decision that, you know, you don't have to pay the full rent considering what you were just dealing with. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you had in mind, Mary Beth. Yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Mary Beth, uh, can I, this is Lori, can I, can I add in, can I, this is, um, I would just add in that um, if you file a cross complaint, um, uh, you, you definitely want to file a cross complaint at the magisterial level if you have an affirmative case against your landlord, particularly if, for example, you're in a situation where the landlord promised to pay you wages um, uh, in exchange for the rent so that you think they owe you money and, um, but it's related to the rental situation. Um, but if you're um, defending an eviction and you followed all the steps required under um, the case law, Pew versus Holmes, um, uh, to withhold the rent, to not pay the rent or pay other expenses as Mary Beth described to make the home habitable, you can ask the magistrate to offset um, any claim for rent owed by the, um, the lack of habitability. So say there's one bedroom in, in the property that's not habitable because there's, there's something that's happened uh, uh, with, with uh, the condition. So you can't go in that room or the, the kitchen or there's something that makes the whole place uninhabitable. The, the magistrate should deduct the amount of, of the, from the amount of rent due, the extent to which the property was uninhabitable. And that can happen whether a cross complaint is filed or not. But, but as uh, Sarah was talking about, you can't um, uh, raise an affirmative claim unless you file the cross complaint. So, um, so having all that proof at the time of the hearing is, is critical to success. Um, and in some ways it depends on who the magistrate is and how they respond to these issues. So the advice that we're giving you and the information we're giving you about this is, is in part dependent on uh, the strength of the case and the judge you're before. Um, and another reason why someone might wanna take their case on appeal to the court of common pleas if they don't think they were treated fairly uh, where they get the right to a new hearing, a de novo hearing on those issues to present them in full measure. I will say, I just wanted to back up a little bit that it's beyond the scope of this presentation and Sarah's rightfully mindful of time, um, but, um, but if, if a landlord does not um, keep the common area secure, they could open themselves up for liability for any personal injury that occurs to the, the people in the apartment complex. Um, that's not the kind of legal case that North Penn Legal Services deal with, but it is the kind of legal case that attorneys who do personal injury can deal with. Um, and we've had some tragic examples of um, uh, people who have uh, been injured or, um, uh, or worse in their, apart in their 
residential unit um, because of a failure to secure the common area um, or the tenant's um, interior door locks or window locks. So it's a critical issue of compliance um, uh, with basic standards of both the, the local codes and, and the state codes. There was a question um, in the chat, Sarah, about what you do if you don't live in a city that has um, a property um, that has um, code enforcement. And I would note, um, you may have some more specifics than that, Sarah, but I would note that the state property code applies. Um, uh, so, and there's usually in the township, somebody who's assigned uh, as a zoning or co code person who you can seek out. Um, I'd also note that again, beyond the scope of this presentation is there's various forms of housing. So if a person is living in subsidized housing, such as section eight, um, the people to contact are the housing authority um, who um, maintain housing quality standards. If it's a low income tax credit property, um, those are typically um, the conditions in those properties uh, are evaluated annually by um, the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency. Um, and there may be a state agency involved depending on the type of building um, uh, that is involved such as um, sort of a, a hotel type building or something like that. And, and enforcement of mobile home parks is with the attorney general's office. Thanks, Lori. And we're going to have Mary Beth just truly speed Thanks, through the Lori. And we're going to have Mary Beth just truly speed through the next slides. Okay. Property lift in the home. So Sarah mentioned before that you don't have to take everything out as soon as the constable arrives at your apartment. And that's true. So within 10 days of vacating the unit, the tenant gives written notice to the landlord. I'm not abandoning this property. The landlord has to hold it for at least 10 days. Um, and they must safeguard it for 30 days, but they can charge storage fees after the 10th day. So it's good to negotiate to get that stuff back as soon as possible. What they can't do is say, great, we're gonna hold it for you, but you have to pay all the money you owe us before we release it. They have to give you an opportunity to get it as long as you give them that notice. And then the return of the security deposit um, these rights cannot be waived in the lease. The way it works, people like to use it when they leave to pay a uh, um, security deposit for the new apartment. But the, what the law says is the tenant gives notice, written notice to the landlord of where to send the security deposit. The landlord has 30 days to either return it in full or give an itemized list of damages of why they're not returning it. If the landlord fails to do either of those, the tenant can sue the landlord for double the amount of the security deposit and the landlord loses the right to keep the deposit for the damages. So it's beneficial to the tenant to give that notice in writing and give that notice of their address so they can get that security deposit back. And they can you can always challenge that too. If the landlord says the damages or you know, $400 and you're like, no, that's absolutely not true. You can challenge that in court. Thanks, Mary Beth. Um, I will add- Thanks, Mary Beth. Um, I will add, can you mute me, Mary Beth? Oh, sorry. Or mute yourself. Okay. Um, I'm gonna talk right now about um, the CDC moratorium on evictions for, for two slides, but I want to let you, everyone know we have a really detailed handbook about landlord-tenant rights that we have in hard copy that we can, you know, get to you within reason if you're, if you're local. Um, we have them in English and in Spanish. They are also available on our website under um, resources um, in, in PDF format, and they're easily searchable in that way, and they go through a lot of this stuff in, in a little bit greater detail. Um, so I'll refer you to that resource. It's on our website. Um, coronavirus. <laughs> okay, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and there have been a lot of various proclamations of 
of governors and um, state uh, higher courts and you know the federal government. There's been a lot of protections for tenants that have been put into effect with various timelines since last year this time. And a lot of the protections that were in place in Pennsylvania sort of they they timed out um, af after a while and and right now, the primary protection for tenants that is related to the pandemic is the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, moratorium on residential evictions. This has gone through a number of different formats um, and it's been extended, I think now four times. So right now, the moratorium is in place until June 30th, 2021. And it is a nationwide ban and each state and all of the um, federal district courts are dealing with, with it differently. And each magistrate in, in, the, in Pennsylvania is dealing with it differently um, in, in some ways. So what happened, um, it was set to end on March 31st. And then the new director of the Center for Disease Control extended it and also issued some updates to it. Um, and one of the updates was that they changed the form that we've been used to seeing and made a new form. And I just kind of, uh, I don't have the form in here. I'll, I'll put a, a link for the, the form that the Pennsylvania court system um, is using. But they basically have a new form that has two columns with check boxes. And if you're a tenant that's facing eviction and you can check a box in column A and column B and then answer a couple other questions truthfully, then the CDC moratorium applies to you. So the declaration still has to be um, completed and signed by all of the adult um, tenants in the property and then presented to the landlord. And if it's in court to the judge um, before it is put in effect. So there is like that affirmative step that the tenant has to take or else no one's gonna consider it. Um, now what, the CDC declaration will do is place a stay on an order for possession so that basically even if it wasn't appealed or the case is just fully lost and over but it's um but the CDC declaration applies then no constable is going to come until after June 30th of this year at this point unless it gets extended so in column A of the new form are these three boxes. If you have received a stimulus check in 2020 or 2021, if you weren't required to report any income to the IRS for 2020, or you're expected to earn in 2020 and 21 less than $99,000 as an individual, $198,000 as a joint filer, if you can click one of those boxes, then column A is satisfied. Generally, if you are someone who receives SNAP benefits or TANF or SSI or Social Security disability, then one of these columns is, you know, column A is going to apply to you. If you, you also must have to check a box in column B. And that is uh, um, the reasons for why you cannot pay your full rent. Either the household income has gone down, you've been laid off from work, wages or hours have been cut or there are extraordinary out-of-pocket medical expenses that prevent you from paying rent, and that's defined um, in, in the order in a, in a um, footnote. You have to be able to check one of those boxes for it to apply. So basically kind of the same similar rules as the previous form, but new format for the declaration. And then if you have checked a box under column A and column B, then you move on to page two, where you have to check every single one of these boxes your income level qualifies you for the reasons stated above. You've done your best to make timely partial payments that are as close as possible to the rent that's owed. If you were evicted, you would probably become homeless or have to move to a shelter or couch surf. Um, and you understand that the, the moratorium is not a rent forgiveness program. Any rent that is assessed during the time that you're not paying rent and that where, where the moratorium is in place for you um, that rent accrues and you still, you still owe it unless you come up with some alternative agreement with the landlord. The lease still applies. You have to follow the conditions of the lease. Um, so the, um, like I said, I'm going to put, um, 
a link to this form that's being used in Pennsylvania courts uh, in the chat box. But this is what the system looks like now. In Pennsylvania, basically for most judges, this is only applying um, where their non-payment of rent is the reason for the eviction. It just has not been decided um, in, in the courts whether this applies in a situation where the lease is not being renewed, where the lease has ended and is not being renewed. And the CDC moratorium order is still silent on that issue. So they don't explicitly apply it to end of lease term. Some judges um, are still allowing it at the end of the lease term to apply as long as these certain other conditions. So the only time where it says in the CDC order that this definitely will not apply to you, there's like five reasons. And it's basically like you're damaging the property. There's criminal activity. And I, I, I don't have them all in front of me, but there's like five reasons why this definitely would not apply to you. So it's still pretty wide open. Many landlords and property management companies have been fighting this in federal court. There's been a couple significant decisions um, and really still anything can happen here as far as whether um, this is going to stand um, for, for any length of time into the future. But all I can say is that right now, the CDC moratorium on evictions is in place in Pennsylvania, generally applies only to non-payment of rent issues, but you can always argue that and it should still apply during an end of lease term. And in order for the CDC declaration to, or moratorium to apply, the tenant has to complete this declaration form, give it to the landlord and to the judge. Um, and then what will happen is that no possession, no constable will come out to take possession of the property until after June 30th. So, are there questions on this? Uh, Sarah, yeah, there is one question related to this. Just they're getting um, getting calls from constituents that have been evicted for different reasons, even during COVID. Um, I'm just wondering why that's still happening. Uh, I suspect it's because they're not for non-payment of rent, but maybe you want to cover that. Right. So yeah, that's what I mean. Is that um, the only time when you can really be sure that this is going to apply? is when the only or absolute primary reason for the eviction is non-payment of rent. Landlords can evict for other reasons. If, the, if they're alleging that the tenant has breached the lease through their behavior or um, you know, just not following the terms of the lease, or if the lease has ended. Um, you know, Many people get a one year lease, the year is up, it's over, okay, your lease is over. Um, so many courts in Pennsylvania are just not allowing the CDC moratorium to apply if those are the reasons for eviction. So this does not cover, it's, this is not a blanket ban on evictions. Evictions are certainly still happening um, while this is in place. Um, so another question is where can a tenant access this form? Um, there, I'm going to post a link to the chat and then you can save that link and provide it to the tenants. Some judges are providing it to tenants who have been, um, have had an eviction filed against them. Um, but it is, it's, it's available online. And, um, you know, if they ask, if they're in court and they ask the judge for it, the judge should be able to provide it. Certainly our office can provide it if you want to send me an email. Um, and I think we might have a probably have a link to it on our website, but I'll I'll put the link in the chat. And then another follow up question um, about something you said. Even though you said the moratorium still applies in the end of lease term, judges can make the call on whether or not to grant possession on a case by case basis. Yes, they can. So so end of lease term is a really kind of wishy washy area. And if the magistrate decides they're not going to issue an order for possession on that basis, then um, the landlord would have to escalate the case to the higher court, the county court, to, to get to get an order for for possession. So, um, and there are there are judges in our area who are taking the position that um, only if you know the circumstances are such that you're you're 
you know, not covered under the, you know, they're, they're allowing it in that case. So yeah, it's possible. It's possible. But many judges are only issue, allowing it if the reason is non-payment of rent. So friends, this is the Fair Housing Summit. And we have covered a, 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 a lot of um, landlord tenant issues because this is important right now and we want everyone to be educated. I'm gonna stop taking questions on any of the landlord tenant and eviction um, issues so that we can move on to the fair housing portion of the, of the program. But if you have questions, continue to put them in the chat and someone will try to, to uh, answer them in the chat. Um, so thank you so much for your for your time and attention to that part of the program. And we're going to move on to fair housing issues. So um, uh, Sarah, as you do that, I'm going to start the first poll. Um, Great. So I'll leave it up for about two minutes. If you would like to have CLE credit, um, if you're an attorney and like CLE credit, uh, be sure you answer the poll. Uh, if not, you don't have to answer it or you can answer no in the poll. Thanks, Tim. I am actively participating, so I'm going to go ahead and answer that. Okay. Um, Lori gave a, a beautiful introduction to the importance of the Fair Housing Act. It was enacted following the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., and the purpose of it is to address inequalities and discrimination in housing. Um, and the same inequalities and discrimination um, that, that existed in housing then still exist today. And there is still a great need for the Fair Housing Act and the protections that it offers. Um, so just to get right into it, um, the main questions that we're gonna discuss here are under the Fair Housing Act and related laws, who is protected? Where, where are they protected? And what types of behavior are is prohibited under the Fair Housing Act? The main underlying question is, is this a case of housing discrimination? Um, so the two primary elements are whether an individual who is experienced dis experiencing discrimination is in a protected class and whether they are living in a dwelling that is covered under the Fair Housing Act. So under the federal law, the protected classes um, include race, color, and national origin, which are frequently sort of um, frequently lumped together as far as the experience of, of the um, individuals experiencing discrimination. There's also religion, um, sex, which includes sexual harassment. And then in 1988, two additional categories were added, familial status and disability. So we are going to discuss each of these in, 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 um, in a little bit of detail, and we're, we're going to go into disability rights a little bit more detailed because there are um, sort of additional steps and affirmative rights for individuals with disabilities under the Fair Housing Act. So these are the protected classes. And dwellings is also defined um, in, in a specific way. So generally what's considered a dwelling, it is going to be any rental property, private or subsidized, meaning um, public housing or section eight or other types of subsidized housing, homes and properties that are for sale, um, manufactured home communities, group homes, nursing homes, um, dorms and residence halls, um, basically places where people dwell. Now, Homeless shelters are considered on a case-by-case -case basis because um, the, the things to consider are whether it is a place where people are invited to live and stay and, and keep as their home, keep their belongings there, um, maybe receive mail there. If it's the type of situation where you, you come in, you stay for a certain amount of time and then you, you know, for overnight and then you have to leave the next day and get back in line again, then the Fair Housing Act um, might not apply to that circumstance. Um, and it's also it also applies to vacant land that's offered for sale or lease. And there is a whole section of the Fair Housing Act that's focused on um, like building code standards for, for developers. And we're not going to touch on that at all today, but that is a, a part of the act. There are some notable exemptions to what is um, considered a dwelling. And basically that is a building with four or fewer units, and the owner lives in one of the units. So an owner occupied four flat or three flat um, that is not 
covered under the Fair Housing Act, although there might be state and local uh, protections against discrimination. A single family house that is sold or rented by the owner without the use of a broker, if the owner does not also own more than three single family homes. So um, if, you know, if it's just sort of a someone who's flipping properties and you own more than three of them, then it's going to apply to you. Um, even if you're selling it on your own without the use of a broker or realtor. Housing that's operated by religious organizations or private clubs can give preferential treatment to members of their religion or club membership, um, but they can't discriminate necessarily in who is allowed in their membership. And then there is an exemption for senior housing, and there's a couple different levels of senior housing. Um, and there are standards. So for example, like you can have a 55 and over community that leaves out younger families, as long as 80% or more of the units in that community are in fact occupied by um, people who are 55 or, or, or over. So um, there are ways that, that those communities have to conduct themselves in order to fall under this exemption. But those are the primary exemptions to whether a place is a dwelling and pulled under the Fair Housing Act. And I'm gonna kick it over to Mary Beth, start talking about I'm gonna kick it over how it's enforced. To Mary Beth, start talking about how it's enforced. So how it is enforced. So we talked about the dwellings and it applies to the protected classes and there's different coverage. So the Fair Housing Act is the federal law. And that sets the minimum protections, which means there can states, municipalities can give more protections as they feel fit. There's also two laws that are specific to recipients of federal funding. So if the housing provider receives funding, so think subsidized housing and other areas, there is HUD's equal access rule, and there is section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. The state law in Pennsylvania is the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act under the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. And in our area, Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton give additional protection. So you can always look at different states, wherever you are, the state or the city or the municipalities to see if they give more, but they can never give less than the protections under the Fair Housing Act, under the federal law. The laws and regulations that are specific to the federal funding housing are the HUD's equal access rule. That requires equal access to HUD programs. Again, think subsidized housing, housing who has financing insured by HUD or FHA insured mortgage financing. And without regard to actual or perceived sexual orientation, gender identity or marital status. So for public housing, Section S housing choice vouchers and project-based Section 8. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, that is specific for individuals with disability. It prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in programs and activities conducted by HUD or recipients of financial assistance from HUD. So it enforces their rights to live there free from discrimination and it covers all HUD programs except for its mortgage insurance and loan guarantee programs. Um, when we get to talking about reasonable modifications later, to, later in a little bit, if the, if the housing provider receives funding under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, they are responsible to pay for any modifications that need to be made. So, it's important to know that it sometimes involves some, you know, detective work to figure out what funding source is for what building because it can get a little complicated, but that information usually is available on the Department of Justice's web, HUD, HUD's website or other areas. The state and local protections. So again, state, cities, municipalities, they can offer more protections. In Pennsylvania, as I said before, there's the Pencil, Pennsylvania Human Relations Act that's under the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. And according to them, it's illegal to discriminate on the basis of age. Um, so if you're 40 or older, uh, you, you get that protection. 
It also protects handlers and trainers of support or guide animals for individuals with disabilities, people associated with individuals with disabilities, and it gives guidance on uh, sex discrimination. And um, it doesn't, so it gives guidance on sex discrimination. Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton cannot discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, or marital status. That's a little more protections than are given under the federal law. And how the Fair Housing Act is enforced. Um, when we think about the Fair Housing Act in terms of our office and in general, um, it's negotiating with landlords can be the first step. So you, a tenant will call us and tell us that they think they're being discriminated against and we investigate and we listen and we get the facts. And if we agree with that, we would first notify the landlord. Do you know about the Fair Housing Act? Do you know about the laws that prevent discrimination? Do you understand what that means? And let me tell you, you're, you're discriminating and you, you're in violation of the Fair Housing Act. And we want to raise that with you. We want to talk to you about that and try to resolve it. It doesn't you represent that person and raise it at the eviction hearing and explain it again and try to resolve that. If things can't be resolved, there are complaints that can be filed. Um, you can file a HUD and urban development, a HUD complaint. You have a year from the date of the incident to file that. So somebody's living in an apartment, they're afraid to file a complaint because of the landlord. They don't wanna be retaliated against which is another violation, they have a year after the incident. So they don't, a lot of people will tell us, I'm going to wait till I move out to file. In Pennsylvania, if it's filed within six months, it's going to go right to the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission for them to review first and can go to the City Human Relations Commission. Depends on what city you're in, how long, how much time you'll have. And if you're filing a suit in state or federal court, it's two years. So there's many ways to get it enforced um, and there's serious consequences to violations of the act. So it's in, very important to actually, you know, follow up on what you think are complaints of discrimination or actions of discrimination. Mary Beth, can I just jump in real quick? Mary Beth, can I just jump in real quick? Sure. Can you mute yourself? So, or can you mute? Yeah. Okay. So I just want to, make sure that it is clear that under the Fair Housing Act, the federal law, there is not explicitly protections for LGBT individuals. And um, that is and has been a, a problem. And Adrian Shanker from the Bradbury Sullivan um, Center is going to address that in great detail in his session with us on Tuesday. But that, so that um, is one reason why HUD's equal access rule is important because that is the one place where um, those protections have been um, for LGBT people in federally funded housing. Recently, the Biden administration did announce that they are going to begin allowing protections for LGBT individuals under um, the, the sex uh, as a protected class. That has not always been the case, and it is that is not a, um, that's subject to be changed again in the future if there's a new administration. So that's not like a permanent and final solution. But right now, um, things are moving in the direction of, of providing some, some additional protections for LGBT individuals. And then I just also wanted to add, um, as far as filing these complaints with, with HUD or the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission, the, um, the complaints can be downloaded from the HUD website you can just Google HUD complaint and I'm sure you'll, you'll get right to it. It is a very simple form. It's like a five page form. And the questions are basically like, who are you? What protected class are you in? What happened to you that you think you experienced discrimination? Who did this to you? Where, when? It is not like a really complicated uh, uh, analysis for some, they, they make it very um, in layman's terms. You don't have to even fill out the form. You can submit it online by filling it out online, or you can make a phone call and they will take the complaint by phone. And then they will generally 
um, investigate the claims by following up with you, potentially following up with the, the landlord. And then there's a whole process that, that HUD or the Human Relations Commission will go through where there's either you know, a conciliation process where you can sort of agree on what the resolution will be and it'll end up in sort of a settlement agreement order from the, the agency or it can be prosecuted by, by HUD or the Department of Justice. There's really sort of any number of ways that these claims can be dealt with depending on what the um, alleged violation is. So I just wanted to touch on that before we jump into sort of a, a, um, specific issues with uh, protected classes. Are there any questions about any of this yet? Uh, no, there haven't been any questions in the chat. Okay, Mary Beth, if you want to cover so this. So the first. Okay, Mary Beth, if you want to cover this. Yep. So when we talk about who is being protected and the protected classes, so we're going to, as Sarah said, go through these a little separately. So for race, color, national origin, who is protected? People of a minority race or perceived to be a member of a minority race based on skin color, people from a country or culture outside of the US or people with ancestors who originated outside of the US. This category includes new immigrants. So um, we know that there's been some you know, increased concern right now in this area. And it's very important to be aware of these protections for this reason. Examples of discrimination. So what we find with discrimination is it's not always very, very obvious. We do like it when it's obvious, you know, like if a landlord says, like, I don't want to rent to them because the, the parents are white and the son is black. That's like, OK, can you put that in writing for us, please? Because now we can follow up with that very clearly. But a lot of times, it's really following your gut, we tell people, and how do you feel? How do you feel when you go there? What's the landlord saying? You go to rent an apartment and you know, you're know you a white woman and you're like, my family and I are moving in and the landlord's like, great, I'll be happy to rent you. Okay, I just would like my spouse to see the place first and your spouse shows up and your spouse is, um, you know, uh, Latino and that's an, and it's obvious that they're Latino and all of a sudden the landlord doesn't want to rent the apartment was taken you know the night before and sorry I didn't tell you and I forgot to call and and cancel this appointment you know that's something that possibly could go either way but to me would say like whoa there's a reason you decided not to rent to me so a lot of times it's really trusting your gut there um, so not, not allow, you know, refusing to rent is obviously would be a case of discrimination, but also applying different kind of terms would be viewed as discrimination, lying or misrepresenting the availability of housing. The example I just gave, again, refusing to rent or imposing more stringent standards on home loans or loans or making loans on less favorable terms, depending on your protected class. So these are things to you know, look at and listen. And again, trust your gut with it. I mean, people usually can figure out when something's just not right. You know, It's a little stinking a little. So just to be aware of that. And it's always like, for us, we always say like, let's investigate it. Sometimes it is just miscommunication or misunderstanding, but a lot of times it's just, you know, blatant discrimination. I'll um, also add to this one. I, I um, realized I neglected that this, this also could include um, Native American um, or American Indian community. Uh, so that that is also like a national origin uh, category. So it doesn't have to be people from a country or culture outside of the United States, it also includes native people um, and communities. And that does come into play a lot when we're talking about um, like uh, zoning laws and lending standards and things like that. So that's another community that's protected under race. Um, I wanted to mention that. Um, another protected class category is religion. And what this um, section does is prohibits instances of overt discrimination against any specific religion. Um, and also, and this is where 
the enforcement comes in more frequently, less direct actions like zoning that is designed to limit, um, say, the, the building of a mosque in a certain community, um, or if it just otherwise places unjustifiable burdens on religious exercise or worship, also li limiting um, the use of home, private homes as places of worship is, is a protection that gets enforced uh, under this standard. And this is probably the class, like even according to the, the HUD website, that is um, where there are the fewest amount of claims filed. Um, and most of those claims are under um, zoning ordinances and laws where there's a municipality that is somehow restricting the um, religious exercise through, you know, building, you know, building standards and things of that nature. Uh, we did talk about the limited exception um, where, you know, um, like what, what constitutes a dwelling. Um, so religious organizations can reserve specific housing for people of their religion who belong to that religion, and there's an exemption for that. All right, the next um, class we're going to talk about in a little bit of detail is um, we're going to talk about sex and sexual harassment. So I did talk a little bit about how this is sort of a um, ever evolving category as far as what's, what are we really gonna include under sex as a category? Is it gonna be sex and gender, uh, LGBT people? Um, you know, who's gonna, who's gonna count under here? Primarily, the initial focus of this category was to protect women um, from being discriminated in housing circumstances. And as it has evolved and where the enforcement is focused on now by HUD and the Department of Justice is to prevent um, sexual harassment of women, particularly lower income women who have fewer housing choices um, from, you know, their, their from, from being sexually harassed by their housing providers. And that could be a landlord or a um, maintenance person, um, anyone who, you know, or a loan officer refusing to, to lend or trying to seek sexual favors in exchange for anything related to housing. That is the specific issue that HUD has been focusing on. And the Department of Justice has a special enforcement program in place right now that is aimed at, at fighting this because um, this is really an unacceptable experience to have to sort of decide between you know, giving in to demands for inappropriate, you know, inappropriate sexual demands and having and maintaining housing for, for a woman and a woman's family. So um, examples of discrimination clearly demanding sexual favors, otherwise creating a sexually hostile environment. And then another big one that comes up, and this also is um, protected under, um, you know, equal access to credit types of laws, uh, pricing discrimination or lending discrimination against women. So that is um, the primary focus of that category right now. I'm going to talk for a little bit about familial status and who is protected under this category. So again, this is one of the um, newer categories that, that came about in 1988 along with um, protections for people with disabilities. So who's protected families with children under the age of 18, pregnant persons or people who are seeking to adopt or in the process of seeking legal custody of minors, um, or any, any person that, that has custody of minor with the written permission of the parent or legal guardian of that minor. There is an exemption here, housing for older persons, which we already discussed. So this is families with children or families who are expecting children who are under the age of 18. The types of discrimination that families frequently experience might be um, uh, an apartment complex refusing to rent a second floor apartment to families or saying there's a certain area of the complex where families have to live. If you have kids, all the kids are over there. So we're not going to put you in this unit that you want that's closest to the bus stop. We're going to put you in the unit that's four blocks away that's closer to the playground. That might seem like a kindness, but in fact, that is a discriminatory action. Straight up saying no children, obviously that's gonna be familial status discrimination. Um, another place where this comes up a lot 
is in limiting the number of people that can be in a unit. So the primary rule here is, um, the default rule is that it's two heartbeats, two people per bedroom. So a four person family can legitimately rent a two bedroom apartment as long as it's big enough under code standards to allow four people in there and it's safe. Um, the housing provider can't say, Mm, it's inappropriate for the, the 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 boy and girl child to live in the same room, or the, you know they can't make any sort of judgment about how you situate yourself in that property. That is a clear example of housing discrimination that affects families. Charging per person versus per unit, you know, like charging a, a extra um, fee for an extra kid, not allowable. So there actually have been a um, fair amount of recent cases in, in the Allentown area and local to us where housing complexes, usually sort of larger housing complexes get investigated um, and have entered into significant settlement agreements um, for taking the kind of actions that I just described. So if you uh, feel like you know, you're dealing with tenants and you feel like they've experienced this, you can refer them to North Penn Legal Services. We do um, advise people on fair housing issues frequently. Um, or if you're not in our area, then this would be a reason to file a HUD complaint and get this followed up on. So we're going to talk mostly, now we're moving into talking about um, rights for people with disabilities under the Fair Housing Act. And we're going to focus on this um, for the rest of, of the session. And we'll have Mary Beth kick us off. Uh, Sarah, before we do that, there is a question related to the protected uh, Sarah, classes. There's a question of whether uh, immigrants who are undocumented are protected. Yeah, yes, I don't think that the Fair Housing Act doesn't apply uh, because someone is undocumented. I am not 100% on that as far as whether there are limitations. So I actually can't, can't answer that with any real confidence. But I do think um, that, you know, would an undocumented individual want to seek redress from the federal government and let the government know, hi, I'm undocumented and this is happening to me? I think that's where the there might be a, an unresolvable tension, but but I don't see why it, it wouldn't apply. It's just that it applies and then also you're going to face whatever immigration consequences from trying to get redress. That's Again, not with 100% confidence because I've not encountered that. Yeah. I um, think generally I, uh, undocumented immigrant, right? That, that category is not a protected class, but immigrants are a protected class. So they would fit into the general you know, race, color, national origin protected class if they're being um, discriminated against because of those reasons. Um, then they're protected. But I think it, it is allowable for at least federal housing um, to say, you know, we uh, and other federal programs to say we um, uh, we need to we can only rent to people who are documented. I think. Yeah, it's definitely you're protected as an immigrant. This is Lori, um, uh, whether you're documented or not under the Fair Housing Act, but um, understanding um, those limitations that Sarah and uh, Tim raised are important. Okay, I'm gonna start with disability. Um, I think, not sure what timeline we're on right now because we have quite a bit to cover. So I'll, I'll talk a little more quickly than usual. <laughs> but uh, so disability is obviously a protected class individuals with disability under the Fair Housing Act. Um, it's defined uh, um, specifically for the Fair Housing Act. I will say that if you have a client who gets supplemental security income or social security disability insurance, they are covered under the Fair Housing Act automatically as an individual with a disability, but you don't have to be receiving that source of income. Okay? Um, many, many people, individuals with disabilities work, they have income, they are not on disability payments from the government. Um, so it's an individual with a physical or a mental impairment. It substantially limits one or more major life activities. 
um, they're regarded as having an impairment or they have a record of that impairment. Okay, so it's a pretty low standard um, to be found disabled for, and, uh, for protections under the Fair Housing Act. So you can't discriminate, but the nice thing is there are additional rights and additional protections for individuals with disabilities. They are allowed to make requests for changes to their housing situation if those changes are needed to allow them the full use and enjoyment of their premises, the same as someone without a disability. The changes must be directly related, what we call a nexus, to their disability. And we're going to go into that. But they are allowed to make these requests for changes. They are called reasonable modifications and reasonable accommodations. So reasonable is important there. Modifications are structural changes um, to any of the common areas, to the exterior, to the interior of the housing premises. So think of um, the most common one we think of is a ramp being installed for an individual with, with a mobility impairment. Reasonable accommodations are changes to policies, rules, practices, leases, okay? So um, something that's not structural and they can be requested either of these at any time during your tendency. So it doesn't have to be right when you move in, things change as you live in places, you may move in and not have a disability. And as you're living there, something happens and you need a modification or accommodation and you have the right to request that. And we're gonna go into that process. So it's a, there's a process for it, but the, one of the things we want to really be aware of is what information the housing provider can request. So if it's an individual with a disability who has an obvious disability, so it's a mobility impairment and that's obvious to you, then that's it. The landlord, the housing provider cannot ask for any more information when you make these requests. If it's not obvious, they can ask them for documentation. The documentation can be from a medical provider or a social service provider, just to confirm that the tenant has a disability and that the request is related to that. So um, my patient is an individual with the disability as defined by the Fair Housing Act. Because of their disability, they require a ramp. Or because of their disability, they require uh, acoustic ceiling tiles to make the noise level quieter. That's what they can request and never should the diagnosis be given, okay? Um, we're gonna go through some of the modification examples. So um, you can go through these more on your own, but think of people with vision, individuals with vision impairments and what they might need to be able to be safe and secure in their apartment. So, you know, grab bars, special lighting, color contrasting. The important thing is you listen to the individual with the disability and let them tell you what they need to be able to live there and have the use and enjoyment of their premises. Hearing impairment, peepholes, flashing lights, um, smoke alarms. And again, if the, you know, if you need something from the provider, to say these are needed, that's fine. But if it's obvious, they cannot request that. Um, mobility impairments, we're talking about, again, ramps, stair, stair glides, carpeting, getting it taken out and replacing it with tiles. Cognitive or memory impairments. So something that you might not always think of is somebody's getting in trouble, you know, getting evicted because they flooded their apartment. The reason they flooded their apartment is they forgot to turn off the sink. The reason they forgot to turn off the sink is because they have a cognitive or memory impairment. So now we have these great sinks where you just put your hand under it to stop, you know, to turn it on. And if you're not there, it automatically turns off. So maybe putting an automatic faucet in or replacing a stove with a microwave. If your client, client is forgetting to turn off the stove and the smoke alarms are going off all the time then you make that replacement. And these are very you know, easily done. And if it's section 504 funding that the housing provider receives, they have to 
assume that cost and they can help a person preserve their housing. So it's, you know, these are really good ideas and a means to get someone to be able to stay in their housing. Accommodations, so, you know, early termination of a lease so they can move to a different apartment that accommodates them. Um, you know, chemical sensitivities. I have a lot of, you know, the tenant says I have a lot of chemical sensitivities. If you're gonna come in and do work, I need more time to get those, more notice of that so I can prepare appro appropriately. Um, somebody who maybe is on social security disability and they get their check in the middle of the month and not the first, and they've been late in paying their rent of an accommodation that they're allowed to pay their rent late when they get their disability payment. And handicap parking, that is always a big one. Um, so it's just, there's more examples there about stopping eviction actions if you need more time to clean and that kind of thing. Um, so it's important to remember about these. Also allowing a caregiver to move into an apartment. Um, that's a big one that we see often. If it's subsidized housing and the person needs a caregiver to move in and that caregiver gets income, that's not, in count, that's not included in making adjustments to the rent. Um, the caregiver, you know, if it's housing or any a private place and it says nobody else can live here, caregiver, that would be a reasonable accommodation example. And assistance animals also. So those are a lot of examples about um, what you can request. Again, it's really talking to the person, the individual with the disability, asking what they need to be able to live there and working with them. So the land, housing provider shouldn't presume what they need to stay there. It should be their ability to tell the provider. Tim, I don't know if you have a second poll that you want to launch. I do, and I was just about to say we should do that now. Uh, while I'm doing that, um, just a couple of I need to make a change to it. Um, so I'll be in a couple of minutes, I'll start that poll. But there is a couple of notes in the comments. Um, uh, it's good to note that the caregiver um, doesn't have a right to the apartment or the voucher, uh, you know, if the participant can't live there any longer. Um, and then also, um, Lori mentioned, we're going to post on our resource page today flyers for undocumented residents who are concerned about applying for the ERAP. Great, thank you. Um, so what we're talking about here is that people with disabilities have extra rights under the Fair Housing Act to ask for modifications or accommodations for their disability. Um, and they can make that request in any kind of way. Um, there are no magic words. Uh, they don't have to use a special form provided by the, the housing provider. It can just be an oral request we certainly prefer that it be a request in writing. So we commonly use a reasonable accommodation or modification letter that cites to the law and the, um, you know, explains what the accommodation or modification is that we are requesting. So there's no special form uh, at this point. It can be made any kind of way, even in conversation. Um, the request can be made at any time prior to actually being evicted, as Mary Beth mentioned, including at the application process, while you're living there, when there's a change to a rule or policy that, that impacts the person with a disability, at the eviction hearing, or in any appeal to a higher court. There is basically, while you're in the unit, or before you get in the unit, you can make this request um, pretty much at any time. There's not like a, a deadline for it. Um, making a request retroactively is probably not going to work after you're out of the unit. So while you're in the unit and you have a request to make, any time works. So the process for making the request is usually you have to make the request in some way, we prefer in writing. You have to make the request so that the landlord knows what you're asking for. So you can't file a HUD complaint for the landlord not doing something that you didn't ask for. So you have to ask it in some way. And then the housing provider has to respond to that request in a reasonable timeline. We usually give it about a, a week, two weeks um, for some sort of response to it. 
the request can only be denied for specific reasons, and we're going to get into those. Um, and if the request is denied, then that reason has to be stated, and then alternative options should be discussed. This is an um, interactive process. It's a conversation with the landlord. And so there is space to sort of be creative and problem solve. Um, but strictly ignoring the request is, is a violation of the Fair Housing Act. And an undue delay in a response to the request is the same as ignoring it, which is the same as denying it. Um, so there are some specific reasons why a denial might be allowed. The underlying principle is if it's a, a overly burdensome for the landlord, then they can deny the request legitimately. So it has to be an undue financial and administrative burden on the housing provider. And that burden is determined by the scope of the operation. So if you have a 60 unit apartment building and you're asking for them to accept your rent on the 10th of the month because of when your disability check comes in um, without charging you late fees, they should be able to absorb that. That's not like a make or break thing for a large housing provider. So the burden of the request is determined by the scope of the housing provider's operation. If the request is a fundamental alteration of the operations of the housing provider, then they can deny it. Um, so if you're asking for them to start a um, program for you of, of some kind that has a cost associated with it, they can deny that. So this is where the reasonableness of the request comes in. And then if the tenant poses a direct threat to the health or safety of other residents or staff or would cause um, or is causing substantial physical damage um, to the property, then those are reasons for denial of the request. So we will frequently have individuals maybe who have um, a mental health episode that results in destructive behavior um, or maybe aggressive behavior towards other neighbors. And the landlord says, look, you're, you're out of here. We're filing an eviction against you. Well, we might make a um, request for a reasonable accommodation to allow that person time to seek additional treatment and manage their behaviors in a way so that they're not threatening anyone's health or safety or their own and they're not threatening property or um, you know, ca causing the, the serious problems. So that's you know, a, an example that we get into a lot. So these are the only legitimate reasons for denying a request, undue financial and administrative burden that fundamentally alters the housing provider's operations or direct threat or substantial physical damage to the property. The process is to open a dialogue, have a conversation, um, Okay, I want to really, um, our sort of our last slide here before we get to questions is about assistance animals and how assistance animals are related to um, uh, reasonable accommodations. Um, so I'm gonna let Mary Beth cover this and then we'll take questions on, on anything. So, whoops. Okay, so assistance animals um, under the Fair Housing Act. So. The idea with assistance animals, which includes service and emotional support animals, is they are a reasonable accommodation request for an exemption to the no pet policy. This is a different law than under the Americans with Disability Act in service animals, so they don't, it's completely different. Um, that one, the ADA covers things outside of housing. This is specific to housing property and housing. Service and emotional support animals are not pets. So we have service animals, which serve a purpose. Think of a dog that helps someone with a vision impairment or a seizure impairment. Emotional support animals are animals that help individuals with uh, mental health or cognitive impairments to manage. They have to, again, show the relationship. So the relationship is shown by getting a letter generally, okay, saying that the animal is needed. They can't charge extra pet deposit or extra monthly rent pet deposit because they are not pets. Very important to remember, no training or, certif or cer certification, excuse me, is needed. So there's no certificate. We often get questions from people saying, well, I don't understand, you know, they don't have the certificate and you can get certificates now online without even knowing the doctor. So how do we know this is really legitimate? 
And my response is, well, they don't need a certificate. They need that letter and that's what is required. There's no breed or weight restrictions, okay? So we should not be hearing, well, you can have an emotional support animal, but you can't have your German shepherd named Henry because he's too big. You have to get rid of Henry, but you can substitute him with a chihuahua. Okay, it, it doesn't work like this. These animals are specific to the individual with the disability. So you, they're not changeable. You know, you can't interchange them. The breed idea is that if the landlord or the housing provider says it's a dangerous breed, and as um, Sarah just went over, you can't presume threats. So you can't say you can't have the dog because it's a dangerous breed. All domestic animals, and I say domestic because some time, one time someone asked me if someone could have a tiger, and that seemed a little you know unreasonable to me. So domestic animals, snakes, ferrets, cats, dogs, birds, fish. Um, oftentimes with birds, you might have two birds because they sing to one another, and that's the soothing component. Generally, it's usually one animal, but again, there are circumstances where you can make arguments for more than one. And they're allowed on all areas of the housing property, okay? So you can't have an assistant animal and be told that you need to carry it through the common areas or that it can't come into the uh, rec room because we're serving food and it's not safe to have animals around food. That is not the way it works. Okay, these are important uh, medical supports for individuals with disabilities, and thus they're allowed to have them as long as they have the proper documentation, which is a letter from a medical or social provider. And I think that's, that's as Sarah said, what we have. So if anyone have any questions, we thank you very much for all your time and spending that with us and giving us a chance to talk. Mary Beth, there is one que uh, question. Or so, what if a uh, uh, service animal or assistance animal causes damage to the unit? Um, are, are they allowed to charge fees in that circumstance? Okay. So that would go to the security deposit. So that's why we have a security deposit in case there's damages to the unit. Um, they can request that the animal, you know, have their shots, be neutered or spread, spayed and not be destructive or not cause a lot of problems. That being said, we have had cases where individuals with disabilities and their service animals are, um, they're having problems caring for them because of their disability. And then we made another reasonable accommodation request to allow them to get services in place to help them care for their animal. So maybe they can't walk the animal that much because of their disability. So we get a dog walker in and the dog walker takes care of the animal. Um, if the animal is, is, is shown, is, is acting in an aggressive manner and maybe being a threat, maybe we agree to get a muzzle on the animal and take them to training. So it's always about working to, to try to keep these, the, I'm sorry, the person and the animal together as a unit because they are necessary for the individual with the disability to have the full uh, use and enjoyment of their premises. Um, so another question, um, going back to the uh, accommodations or modifications, um, what happens if the landlord ignores or denies the request? Uh, and what would be an example of a reasonable denial? So as Sarah was saying, there's only certain reasons they can deny the request. So if it's an unreasonable administrative and financial burden, or if it's a threat, or if you think, or if they did damages, um, the burden is pretty high to prove that it's unreasonable. If you're encountering cases like that, I strongly encourage you to call our office for assistance or you know, give us a call afterwards and we're happy to discuss that with you. Uh, it's a case by case basis. If you go to the Department of Justice website, they have a list there of cases 
where people, where housing providers have been held accountable for denying these requests. And you can see that the burden is, again, rather high. Um, so I can't, I can't think of a specific example now of, you know, when they would be allowed to deny uh, unless it meets those specific guidelines. And you can't presume threats. You can't say because an individual has a mental health impairment, we think they're going to be a problem moving forward. Or because someone has a um, pit bull or a larger dog, we presume that's going to be a problem. And um, as in all of these, um, if if the if the landlord um, denies the the request and there's no sort of resolving it, then the solution, well, the thing, the next step is to file the HUD complaint. So that that would be an example of when um, you know the landlord is not complying with the Fair Housing Act, and that would be a good time to look into filing a complaint. Then you might have a um, either HUD or the Human Relations Commission coming through and sort of getting involved and encouraging the landlord to um, take the correct steps. And and that process takes a little while to work itself through. So if someone's facing an eviction and there, you know, there doesn't seem to be a way to resolve this, then filing the HUD complaint as, you know, a way to force the conversation is, would, would be appropriate. I don't want to, it's 11 o'clock. Oh, go ahead, Maybe. I was going to say, it's because the HUD complaint can take a while to process that we strongly, we, we try in our office to really negotiate with the landlord, educate them on these, on these laws and regulations to try to resolve the matter because it takes long to resolve it the other way. But there are cases where landlords, you know, refuse to do that. And like Sarah said, then the solution is to file a HUD complaint and follow through with that. 